Up until now, we've only looked at structures with two sections to them, a p-type and an n-type semiconductor, or a metal and a semiconductor. Now we're going to add a third type. So we'll have a metal oxide semiconductor, MOS. We'll have a, a, a con good conductor, an insulator, and a semiconductor, forming a three-level structure. Before we can dive into that, we need to cover some surface physics. If I have a surface, here we go, with a bunch of electrons near the surface, and one of those electrons wants to escape. In order for it to escape, it needs to find some energy to get away with in order to, to pay its fare. And the energy that it has to have to get out is the work function, which we depict with uh, the letter psi, time times the charge, the psi is in the volts. That's the work function of that material. And if an electron acquires the work function and escapes, it, it is a bare minimum amount of energy it needs to escape. So it will have zero kinetic energy once it's free, but it will be free. The energy that it will have when it is free we'll call the vacuum energy. So the vacuum energy is the energy difference between a surface electron and a free electron. And we're going to continuously be referring to the vacuum energy E sub zero uh, from now on, so I, I want to uh, make sure that uh, you're comfortable using that terminology. Now, so that's the work function, same work function you learned about when you studied the photoelectric effect. One other uh, material property is the electron affinity, which is the difference in energy between the conduction band edge and the vacuum energy. And that, more than the work function, is a property of the material. You can be sure what the electron affinity is if you know what the semiconductor material is. It's a little less clear what the work function is because the work function depends on doping, being the difference between Fermi energy and vacuum level. If you dope differently, you move the Fermi energy and you change the work function. These two properties are related to each other by an expression that you can surmise just by looking at this energy band diagram. The work function, which I'll call collectively Q times P sub S, minus the electron affinity is this little bit of energy here, E sub C minus the quasi-Fermi energy. Uh, whether it's E sub Fn or E sub Fp, those are supposed to be capital Fs. I can't really give you a table of work functions because of the doping dependence, but I can show you a table of electron affinities. Electron affinities we're going to use the most are the top two. So make a note of this. For silicon, the electron affinity is 4.05 electron volts, and for silicon dioxide, it's 0 0.95 electron volts. That's really independent of doping. So as you do change the doping level of the silicon, the electron affinity, affinity will remain at 4.05 electron volts. Similar for value for gallium arsenide and for germanium and indium phosphide. So seems to be a, a four electron volt a consensus there. If you need to really change it, we can move on to the alloy, the semiconductor aluminum gallium arsenide, where you can tune the electron affinity along with the energy gap by adjusting the alloy level X. But make a note of these two, silicon and silicon dioxide. So this is a pair of, of materials, silicon and silicon dioxide. So we're working our way up to a threefold MOS capacitor. So we looked at the energy levels. They both have band gaps, no bias voltage, therefore in equilibrium. The Fermi energy needs to be a horizontal line all the way across the same value in both materials. And that's good. That sets where you put the, the other, other band edges. So we have the valence and the conduction band edge. And if it's pure silicon, you know, the Fermi energy is pretty much in the middle of the gap. And then as well for uh, um, silicon dioxide, the, the gap, the energy gap, band gap for silicon dioxide is 9 electron volts. It's not shown there. The vacuum level is 0.95 EV above the conduction band for the silicon dioxide, 4.05 for the silicon. And so this is a very important number, 3.1 EV. When you have silicon hooked up to silicon dioxide, the conduction band edge of the silicon needs to be 3.1 EV lower than the conduction band edge for the silicon dioxide. Make a note of that. It's an important thing to keep straight. So now we have our three three layer structure. So there's metal, oxide, and semiconductor. So the metal, which in most practical situations is actually a degenerately doped semiconductor. And so that's what, that's what we're going to assume here. And that's, that, that actually makes uh, for a 
we got a more interesting uh, band structure here. So, so this this is what we'll do. We'll, we'll use p-type semiconductor that is so heavily doped that its Fermi energy has been driven right down to the valence band. It's a p plus gate, we'll call it. Plus means degenerately doped. We'll have a type band semiconductor. So, really, what, the way this thing is fabricated is you take a big chunk of silicon, you end dope it, you grow some oxide on it, you oxidize the the, the surface. And then you deposit some more silicon, and you uh, dope it heavily with uh, with with uh, something to make it a p-type. So that's how that's done. Uh, I would urge you to compare this diagram to Figure 5-3 in the textbook. So here we're doing an n-body, uh, n-type substrate, n-type uh, semiconductor for the body. Figure 5-3 does the same thing with a p-type semiconductor for the body. And you really need both to know both both the types. So study this and five figure five dash three together. Just put them both in front of you just so you can see the distinct differences and similarities. So this is uh, this diagram here though is for a zero gate voltage. So yeah, I put a voltage gate voltage. Let me explain that. I put a, a volt power supply across it. Ignore the fact that I put a ground there. That's just for uh, decorum. <laughs> um, but I put a, I attach a battery across the, the structure. I have, a, I have a terminal on the metal and I have a terminal on the, the N type semiconductor, the metal, which is P type uh, degenerate. And I uh, have it set to zero. So that's an, that's an adjustable uh, battery. Okay, so it's set to zero and this is what everything looks like. So setting this to zero is the same thing as, as having a short circuit all the way across here. Fermi energy needs to be horizontal and continuous all the way across because without any voltage we're in thermal equilibrium. So we do that. In this gate, we call it the gate. We're going to keep calling it the gate. The gate is uh, de degenerately doped, so the Fermi level and the, the valence band are, are at the same level. It's degenerately doped at P type. So uh, if we're degenerately doped N type, the Fermi level would be up here at the conduction band, but it's P type. So that sets where this goes, and this is what the the band structure for the uh, P, the degenerate semiconductor is. Then there's let's go all the way over here to the n-doped substrate, the the n-type semiconductor. First of all, it also has to have the same band gap. It's 1.12 for silicon, so that that's 1.12. This has to be 1.12 eV, so that has to be the, the case. In the bulk of this semiconductor, the Fermi energy needs to be in the correct place, consistent with the doping level. Now it's n-doped, so it's closer to the conduction band than the valence band. So I drew it that way. You know, there's no numbers involved, but it's something like this. Uh, so I drew it like that. The thing about semiconductors at interfaces is that their bands bend. If it's an n-type semiconductor, you can usually expect that the bands are bending upward in equilibrium. That is no applied voltage. If it's a p-type, you would expect the bands to be bending downward. Basically, the bands bend uh, bends in such a way that the Fermi energy moves away from the preferred band. So this is an n-type semiconductor. The Fermi energy prefers to be close to the conduction band. When you get close to an interface, that Fermi energy needs to be farther than from its preferred band. And so that's how you remember the conduction band and the valence bands bend upward. Bands bend upward to increase that distance. This distance between the conduction band and the, uh, and the oxide on either side has to be held at 3.1 electron volts. Let's just get these things showing up here then. So that's 1.12 and that's 3.1. So that has to be held at 3.1 eV. So uh, the locations of these of these uh, bands in, in the bulk and the bands in the metal are are pretty are set by the fact that the Fermi energy is the same all the way across. Um, but uh, but then there is some upper bending which we're going to spend a lot of time studying. And then from there, up 3.1 eV, we arrive at the conduction band of the insulator. And notice I drew the conduction band and valence band of the insulator slanted. They're always nine electron volts apart, not to scale, <laughs> but the the conduction band and valence band edges 
bend downward uh, so so they can they can go go down oh, oh there's one other thing that that I really want to add to this this figure and it's not in figure 5-3 and but it's really missing <laughs> and that's the vacuum energy so let's add in the vacuum energy um, and we'll talk about that in a second so if I add in the vacuum energy Remember, it always has to be 4.05 electron volts above the conduction band when you're in silicon. So here it is, 4.05 above it. And it always has to be 0.95 above the conduction band edge when you are in silicon dioxide. And so this distance is maintained at 0.95 EV. And if the, the, bands are, the energy levels are slanted, then the vacuum level is slanted. So don't think that the vacuum level has to somehow be a horizontal line all the way across. That would be nice, but it's just not the way it is. If an electron were to escape for, from silicon dioxide or from n-type silicon, uh, when, it, when it gets free, it, it won't have the same energy as if it escaped from, from uh, p-type silicon. So there's no re reason actually why the vacuum level has to be a horizontal line. There isn't. What it has to be is always... 4.05 electron volts above the conduction band edge in silicon. And so here where the conduction band edge even has curvature, it has curvature. Okay. Now there's a very important condition where we get this curvature to go away. And that is used then as, as the reference point in MOS structures, MOS capacitors and MOS FETs. And so I want to get that, that uh, state defined here, and then we'll spend uh, you know, the rest of Chapter 5 just understanding that, so that when we get, get into the next chapter and we deal with MOSFETs, uh, we're, we're good with what it takes to flatten this band and why it's important. So let's just talk about first what it takes to flatten it. Let's, let's make this a flat band. And you do it with the voltage. By, bring, by turning on this voltage now, it was zero, for these bands, we, if we start to ch to raise it, what we're really doing is putting negative potential over here at this terminal of the semiconductor. And when you do that, you know, if you put negative potential on a semiconductor, you know, it chases the electrons away. The electrons don't want to be there. And remember, all of these energy level diagrams are for for electrons. When you put a negative potential over here. It's an uncom becomes an uncomfortable place for electrons to be, so the energy goes up, and so we drive up the these energies. Um, uh, so basically, electrons which are were perfectly fine over here to the left of the semiconductor, suddenly they want to get to the go to the go this way. That's the right <laughs> to the right of the semiconductor. They suddenly want to go this way to the left, uh, and they do. But there's also a big, huge energy barrier right here, right? This 3.1 electron volt energy barrier. So they'll go this way, but then they'll run into a barrier. Uh, so the voltage of the battery, the negative potential, shoves the electrons back over here, but uh, but they can't go go any farther. Over here, we have no trouble getting the energy levels to go up. Uh, the electrons are fine, just just rolling downhill, but eventually the hill comes to a stop. Flat band occurs when everybody flattens out the valence band, the conduction band, and both the, the dielectric and the semiconductor and the vacuum energy all flatten out. And we have uh, now the, the Fermi energies, you know, no longer need to be the same either because once you turn on that voltage, you're not in thermal equilibrium anymore. And so now you have a quasi Fermi energy that you have to talk about with the semiconductor. If you flatten everything out, now the conduction band edge and the degenerate semiconductor metallic gate and the conduction band edge in the n-type semiconductor are going to be commensurate. There's a, they'll, they'll rise to the same, same level uh, because they both have to be 4.05 electron volts behind, uh, under the vacuum level, which is flattened out. The valence bands have flattened out. The work function in the n-type is the quasi Fermi energy level actually it hasn't changed but it's now written in terms of the quasi Fermi energy level so now the work function in the n type can can be written in terms of the quasi Fermi energy and just look at what it is there's the work function 
uh, there's the work function of silicon, which is the 4.05 electron volts, plus this difference, which is E sub C minus E F N. So this is an expression that comes right out of the energy band diagram. But we'll park that one and use it. Uh, the, then there's the, the electron affinity in the insulator, which remains 0.95 EV, but now it's it's uh, horizontal and uh, vacuum level is horizontal. Then you know, you also have the the work function in the in the gate material, the the p-type semiconductor. The valence band and the Fermi energy are still you know commensurate with each other uh, there, and so it's still that difference. This is the most important thing to note that the um, the voltage of that battery that gives you this flat band condition is the difference between the Fermi energy of the n-type material and the Fermi energy of the p-type. Because when the voltage was zero, remember, these two were commensurate with each other. They were at the same level, the, the Fermi energy of the semiconductor on the n-type and the Fermi energy of the gate material were at the same energy level. Their splitting is because of the added voltage. So you just take the difference in these two energies, the difference in the Fermi energy of the gate and the Fermi energy of the substrate, and that difference is the flat band potential energy, uh, Q times the flat band potential. Or as I'll write it this way, it's the work function of the gate minus the work function of the semiconductor, P sub S. And that's the flat band potential. So that all that was to get us to the first equation in chapter five, but that I think was was begging some uh, extra explanation. So so we did it. Um, I'll pause with that that at that for for now and come back uh, in a little bit here.